Today, the so-called Mothman, a humanoid monster with red eyes and big bird-like wings, is a fixture of paranormal horror, immortalized in film. But though it has since slid into the realm of fiction, the Mothman was first based on a well-documented wave of sightings in the northeastern United States between November 1966 and December 1967. These sightings coincided with a range of other anomalous phenomena far stranger than anything portrayed in the movie adaptation. The sheer volume of these reports, as well as their coincidence in time and space, make the Year of the Mothman one of the most fascinating and perplexing case studies in anomalous history. In November 1966, there began a wave of anomalous activity across the northeastern United States, manifesting primarily in West Virginia and the northern Ohio River Valley. The small town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, situated at the confluence of the Ohio and Kanawha Rivers, was a particular hotspot, as was the McClintic Wildlife Nature Preserve just a few miles north. The first of the so-called Mothman sightings was on November 1st, outside the National Guard Armory on the northern edge of Point Pleasant, facing the Nature Preserve. A National Guardsman was on duty when he saw what he thought was a man in a brown suit perched on a tree limb beyond a high fence. The guard then determined that the figure belonged to an extremely large bird, but when he returned to see it later, the thing was gone. The next night, on a rainy evening, Woodrow Derenberger was driving home along Interstate 77 when a dark, charcoal gray metallic looking vehicle cut in front of him. It was shaped like an old-fashioned kerosene lamp chimney and was floating just above the ground. The vehicle slowed to a stop, forcing Derenberger to brake. Then, a door slid open, and a heavily tanned man emerged and approached Derenberger's truck. The man had a large grin on his face and kept his arms crossed with both hands under his armpits. He was wearing a sparkling green garment under a dark coat. Derenberger claimed that the stranger never spoke aloud or even moved his lips, but somehow communicated with him, as if telepathically. He told Derenberger not to be afraid, then introduced himself as Cold. While Cold asked about Derenberger's work, and the city lights in the distance, the lamp-like UFO raised over 50 feet, or 15 meters, off the ground, allowing other cars to pass beneath. Cold ended the few minutes of discussion by instructing Derenberger to report the event to authorities, and mentioning that he would soon return. Silently, the flying vehicle descended to the ground. Cold entered, and it flew rapidly into the air. Derenberger reported the incident to Parkersburg police, and the media picked up the story in the following days. After this, several other witnesses came forward to corroborate both the presence of the flying craft and the grinning man. Derenberger's farm and phone line were quickly flooded with unwanted attention, including threatening calls, and calls with nothing but odd beeps and electronic sounds. Derenberger experienced further telepathic exchanges, as well as physical meetings with Cold, who later revealed that his first name was Indrid, and that he came from another planet. Even Derenberger's psychiatrist reported having telepathic contact with Cold in December 1966. On November 12th, Kenneth Duncan was digging a grave with four other men in a cemetery southeast of Point Pleasant when he heard a rustling in the treetops, then saw a brown flying man gliding through the trees for about a minute. Another unusual sighting took place northeast of Point Pleasant on November 14th. After 10.30 p.m., farmer Merle Partridge and his wife were watching their television when it began to emit a loud noise that Merle likened to a high-pitched generator winding up. The couple's German Shepherd began howling from the porch before the TV's tube exploded and shattered glass on the floor. Grabbing a flashlight and gun, Merle got out to the porch to see the dog run towards the barn. At that point, Merle, his wife, and at least one of their sons saw two silent circling red lights that disappeared after a few minutes. The dog never returned. In an interview decades later, 
Merle clarified that what he saw was mechanical and electrical in nature, despite an earlier reporter calling them eyes. The first sighting of a cryptid to reach the media occurred on the night of November 15, 1966. Around 11 p.m., two young married couples, Roger and Linda Scarberry, and Steve and Mary Mallet, were joyriding on back roads through the wildlife preserve. After stopping close to the retired power plant, Steve noticed two large red eyes lit up by the car's headlights. Into their view came the outline of a creature with the body of a man and large wings like an angel folded around it. It was later estimated to be six to seven feet, or about two meters tall. Captured by its hypnotic red eyes, the couples just stood there staring until the creature shuffled away. Then fear kicked in, and Roger started driving home. Upon turning a bend on Route 62, their headlights again lit up the winged creature, which took off straight into the air with just a single beat of its wings, and began to follow the vehicle. Roger quickly approached 100 miles per hour, or 160 kilometers per hour, but the gray figure kept pace until they reached the lights of Point Pleasant. Roger stopped the car when the group spotted a large dog dead on the side of the road. Just then, the creature emerged from nearby, jumped over the car, and staggered away. The group returned with police, but the dog's carcass was gone. Shortly after, however, police found the burnt remains of a dog elsewhere in the preserve. The four witnesses were separated at the Mason County Sheriff's Department to write depositions, and Roger Scarberry drew a sketch of the creature. Its leg muscles were human-like, though witnesses did not see knees, and they were unsure if the creature had any arms. Witnesses could not distinguish fur, feathers, or whatever else covered its body, but it was a dark gray in color. The next day, Local newspapers picked up the story, and by 9 p.m., the police received a call about another encounter with the creature from three witnesses at a home on the edge of the preserve. The day after that, a reporter with the Huntington Herald Dispatch called this creature the Mothman, despite witnesses describing a creature that was more bird-like in appearance. There is no record of any witnesses describing the creature as moth-like. Rather, Birdman was the most frequently used descriptor, with Mothman only rising in popularity years after the events. As the weeks went by, the story of the Birdman spread beyond Point Pleasant, and more and more witnesses came forward in the surrounding regions. Mary Heyer, the Point Pleasant reporter for the Athens Messenger, began collecting stories. Ufologist Gray Barker, who had previously investigated the Flatwoods monster of 1952, came to town in late November, and New York journalist and anomalist John Keel arrived in December. The three investigators quickly developed a working relationship. While descriptions of the Birdman varied, most witnesses said that it was six to seven feet tall with a 10 to 12 foot wingspan, or two meters tall with a three to three and a half meter wingspan. Its face was rarely seen but for the eyes. Those who reported seeing red eyes said that they were especially captivating or hypnotic. Some witnesses described the creature leaping straight up from the ground, and though it flew around like a soaring bird, it was very rarely seen to flap its wings, if at all. Most witnesses said that the creature was totally silent, though a few claimed that it made a squeaking sound. Many of the later encounters involved the creature pursuing vehicles at high speeds. Thomas Urey saw a huge bird flying alongside his car without ever flapping its wings, while Faye DeWitt Laporte saw a creature running alongside her vehicle. Keel estimated that over 100 witnesses sighted this type of creature over the winter of 66 and 67. The Birdmen weren't the only strange things seen in the sky. Keel found dozens of UFO witnesses across the Ohio River Valley, and after Mary Heyer and other papers began publishing their stories, the region's news teams received up to 20 reports each day. 
Keel also discovered multiple UFO witnesses who had sightings earlier in the year, but hadn't bothered to report them. The witnesses included Hire herself, who had seen a perfectly round object shining in the sky that summer while driving along the Ohio River. The witnesses to the Birdman sighting on November 16th had seen a large red light flying above them on their drive to the house, and several more saw the same thing from other vantage points. Like the Birdmen, UFOs were often seen following cars. For example, on March 5, 1967, Bo Schertzer and a nurse were driving along the Ohio River in a Red Cross bloodmobile when a bright white UFO appeared and kept pace with their truck. The craft even extended two arms towards them, seemingly to pincer them, before another vehicle approached on the highway and the UFO flew away. In one case, a woman saw a seven-foot or two-meter-tall red-eyed gray man-like figure fly over her car, and for the following two weeks, her eyes were swollen with conjunctivitis. A number of witnesses had multiple experiences. During the summer of 67, months after their first encounter, Merle Partridge claims that he and his family were relaxing around their swimming pool when the entire sky blacked out and an enormous mechanical UFO appeared with many portholes and rivets. The Partridge family also received phone calls with odd beeping sounds and experienced poltergeist activity in the house. The Lilly family had many sightings of silent colored UFOs over their home that coincided with interference on the TV. Later, they heard cabinet doors slam in the night and other unexplained sounds. Mary Heyer, John Keel, and other witnesses received calls clogged with crazy beeps and buzzes, or odd voices that one person described as metallic. There were also several cases of horses, dogs, and cows disappearing or being discovered dead in unusual circumstances. Keel personally examined carcasses with no trace of blood and what looked to be surgical-like incisions in their throats. Mothman researcher Jeff Wamsley spoke to a Point Pleasant resident by the name of Lawrence Gray, who claimed that in August, months before the first sightings in November, he saw a dark winged creature in his bedroom that he believed to be the devil. As they stared at each other, Gray tried to speak but couldn't, but when he turned his thoughts to biblical scripture, the creature gradually evaporated. Many witnesses also had unusual interactions with men with tanned skin and Asian or Native American looking facial features. Some locals reported people with long hair and dark East Asian faces crossing their property late at night. The men were seen wearing bright reflective clothes, while the women wore ankle length dresses, all before the hippie movement of the late 1960s. Other witnesses saw men that were dressed out of place often in black suits, and that frequently arrived in dark, older model cars in pristine condition. Mothman witness Marcella Bennett was nearly driven off the road by a man in a red car wearing a bushy wig. Hire had a similar encounter with three men in a black Cadillac. Connie Carpenter, the witness who developed conjunctivitis, was later almost pulled into a 49 Buick by a man in black. Carpenter's home was also visited by a strange man, and for two weeks after, objects turned up in odd places, and pictures fell from the walls. Police were alerted to three very tall and heavily tanned men knocking on doors around Point Pleasant late at night, supposedly selling magazine subscriptions. Others said that they were census takers. Others just asked for a glass of water, which Keel noted was an old fairy trick reported in the Middle Ages. A woman posing as Keel's secretary also interviewed people whom Keel had previously spoken with. Heyer said that two nearly identical men in black overcoats visited her office in December 67 and asked her what she would do if someone ordered her to stop writing about flying saucers. Later that same day, another similar man came in to ask the same question, claiming to be a UFO researcher. The following day, 
Linda Scarbury and her family were visited by a man who was interested in Keel's relationship to hire, and who asked her the same unusual question. Two men in black posing as salesmen questioned people in Woodrow Derenberger's town about his roadside encounter. Derenberger also had several visits from similar men. His house was ransacked, and his writings and letters disappeared. Keel also experienced mail that went undelivered, or had obviously been opened, and plenty of strange phone calls and sounds suggesting that his line was tapped. As sightings of bird-like men and UFOs declined in 1967, Keel received phone calls from contacts who claimed to be other beings, or to channel some non-human intelligence. Many of these contacts offered predictions for the near future, some of which were accurate, in whole or in part. Contacts warned of impending disaster on the Ohio River, implying that a factory would explode. But the most impactful precognition came from Heyer, who related to Keel a nightmare she'd had of people drowning in the river with Christmas presents floating around them. Other locals also told Keel and Heyer of their feelings of unease. On December 15, 1967, one of the traffic lights was out next to the Silver Bridge connecting Point Pleasant to Canaga, Ohio. The 700-foot suspension bridge was packed with vehicles, and around 5 p.m., a corroded eye bar failed, causing the bridge to collapse in a catastrophic event that took 46 lives and injured nine others. Some of the deceased were witnesses to UFOs. Mentions of UFOs and birdmen were immediately dropped from the media in the wake of the disaster, but sightings continued. Years later, reports of birdmen, UFOs, and men in black seen around the bridge that night began to emerge again, but these are hard to verify. However, Keel reports that the Lilly family spotted 12 birdmen flying south from the wildlife preserve towards Point Pleasant on the day of the bridge's collapse. Additionally, Mary Heyer informed Keel that a woman who lived by the bridge witnessed two men dressed in black pants and checkered coats, climbing it two days prior to the collapse. In hindsight, many viewed the Birdman sightings and other strange phenomena as negative omens, preceding the bridge's collapse. In 1970, Gray Barker published a creative account of events in the Silver Bridge, and five years later, John Keel published his own account in the Mothman Prophecies. Since then, there have been several more books and documentaries on the topic. The iconic, if misnamed, cryptid is now a well-known archetype of paranormal fiction, made popular by the loose adaptation of Keel's work to film in 2002's The Mothman Prophecies. Before this film, the anomalous events weren't publicly acknowledged in the Point Pleasant area. There were no visible signs, monuments, or tourist shops, for example, though the town has since embraced the Mothman legacy. The first annual Mothman Festival took place in 2002, and three years later, Mothman researcher and author Jeff Wamsley opened the Point Pleasant Mothman Museum. Few have attempted to debunk the events of 1966 and 7, Soon after the first sightings, a West Virginia University professor speculated that the locals were seeing a large sandhill crane, though witnesses found the suggestion insulting. Debunker Joe Nickel believes that the birdmen were simply owls and other large birds, and later, pranksters. But the Mothman sightings at Point Pleasant are far from the only reports of unusually large flying creatures in the area. Since at least the 18th century, North American natives such as the Alini and Dakota have recorded encounters with the Thunderbird, a flying creature large enough to carry away large animals. There are also several reports of flying humanoids from the 19th and early 20th centuries. For example, history professor James Gay Jones of Glenville State College claims to have collected information of sightings dating back to the early 1900s of a large bird covered in dark reddish feathers with the head of a man and a wingspan exceeding 12 feet, or 3.6 meters. These sightings persisted into the 1940s, in the same counties that the Mothman appeared. 
Wamsley has documented Birdman sightings in every decade since the 1960s. As recently as 2017, the Chicago region experienced a wave of reports of winged birds, bats, and owls surpassing six feet tall, which occasionally sported bright red eyes. In one instance, a bright green UFO flew by just five minutes after the sighting. Whatever people saw in the late 60s seems to have been part of a much older and more enduring phenomenon. The so-called Mothman sightings of 1966 and 7 were part of a centuries-old tradition of seeing large birds and other flying creatures in the northeastern United States. But they also coincided with a range of other anomalous phenomena, including UFO sightings, poltergeist activity, animal mutilations, and encounters with men in black. We may never know why such an abundance of activity manifested in the Point Pleasant area in the late 1960s, but clearly, they were all related at a level beyond mere geography. You can help choose our next video topic by pledging $3 a month or more on Patreon. There are many more rewards at other tiers, including monthly update videos and a Discord channel. Become a patron today. Think Anomalous is created by Jason Charbonneau. Research by Clark Murphy. Music by Josh Chamberlain.